We are so thankful for thy son, Jesus Christ. And as Elder prayed, Lord, we want our eyes to be open. So please bless us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I'm looking forward to open up the word of God. Are you ready to study? We have some tremendous things that we need to study this morning. Uh, let's take our Bibles first and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. What book did I say? We're going to Isaiah the first chapter. We want to notice something very interesting from the Word of God. And I believe that you and I are, as a people are blessed. Seventh Adventism as a people are blessed. That what God has given us the opportunity to see and to hear from the Word of God very soon is going to get into the ears of the entire world. Am I right? Now do you know that on the earth today there are over eight billion people, um, a billion people on earth today, and there are only about 25 million seven day Adventists plus or minus. Now, if you think about that, what percentage of the world population is that? If you have eight billion people plus or minus, a little more, and you have about 25 million seven day Adventists, is that 10 percent? Is that 10 percent of the world? No. no. Is it one percent of the world? That means that 25 million is actually less than one percent of the world's total population. As a world body, Seventh-day Adventists are considered minimalists, almost as if we're little heard of, little known, that most people have never even heard of Seventh-day Adventism in the world. But do you know that we're told that very soon all of this is going to change? That very soon this little group of people called Seventh-day Adventists is going to be known to the entire world. I want to be a part of that great explosion. What do you say? Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, we're familiar with this chapter as we're going around this winding staircase. We want to look a little bit deeper and clear at this verse. Isaiah chapter 2, we want to pick up now in Isaiah 2 beginning in verse 2. Very familiar passage of scripture to us in our study. Let's read that together. You're there, amen? amen. Father, again, anoint your words as we have opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 2, let's read it together. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass when... In the last days, here's a last day prophecy that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established where in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And what's going to happen? <clears throat> now, remember, seven Adventists represent less than one tenth of the world total population. But the Bible says in the last days, how many nations are going to flow into it? How many nations? All nations. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. When the Bible says, <clears throat> says it's going to be established on top of the mountains, we know that any time you exalt something is so that it can be noticed, that it can get an attention. When you put a sign up, nobody puts a sign down here on the ground in the highway. Am I right? Yeah. Why don't they put the sign on the highway way down at the ground? Well, if you did, you, nobody will pay money for it. <laughs> no advertisement there. But the higher you lift it up, the more attention and notice it can get. So the Bible says the church of God in the last days is going to be exalted so that every nation will know who Seventh Adventism is. Every people on the globe will know it. This is what it means when it says an angel is flying in the midst of heaven. It will get the attention of the entire world. Now, my brothers and sisters, in order for that to happen, something must take place. And this is why I in no way, in no way are in any way uh, uh, challenged or, or feel that, that, that there's something wrong when you are in a little church like you and I have right now. You know why? Because very soon this little church is going to reach the entire world if we remain faithful to God. Now look at what it says. How is it going to happen? How are all nations going to flow into it? Verse 3 says, And many people, not a few, but many shall do what? Go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of the God of what? Yes. Now, notice why they're coming. You know why. Look at what the text says. Not because we say so. Look what the Bible says. Why are they coming? And he will what? Teach us. Now, I want you to understand something. This is not what God is saying. Now, God is, God is saying this through the prophet, but God is actually telling us what the people from every nation are saying why they come to the church. They're telling us the reason. Question. Do they say because of the nice pews that you have in your church? Because the church is a nice edifice. It's so big and large and, and it's a, a multi-million dollar church. Is that why they're coming? That's not why they're coming. Is it because of all the programs we have for children, all the programs that we have about this and that and the other? That's not why they're coming. 
The Bible says that we can overhear in the last days why they're coming and they're going to be saying all nations one to another. Go, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will, talk to me somebody, teach us. So why is the world going to flow into the Seventh Adventist Church? Why? Because of our what? Teachings. So then what does it mean that our church should be doing? We need to be teaching. And if we're not teaching, guess what? The nations won't flow into us. But if we can do as Jesus did, the great teacher, with the same spirit that he had, why there will not be a building in Palestine that can house the multitudes that will flow into the church of God in these last days. Now, the Bible says that what they're going to teach, though, they're not going to just be teaching anything. Because, see, Babylon is teaching, but they're teaching false doctrines. But the Bible says they're going to teach what? What is it going to say? It says, and he will teach us. What's the next two words? Talk to me, somebody. His, way. his not way, but his what? In other words, every way of God, they're going to be teaching. And as a result of teaching these ways, the nations are going to see how God does things and are going to flow into the church because they hear how God does his work. The Bible says that they're going to teach his ways. And we will walk in the past, for out of Zion will go forth the law, shall go, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you think that everybody is living in harmony with God's way right now? The Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. So there's a difference between the way of heaven and the way of the earth. And in teaching God's way, it says all nations will flow in. But now watch what this says. Fundamentals of Christian Education 29. It says there are many in the church who at heart belong where? To the world. But God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of what? Today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? The reason we have had so little what? Yeah. Now remember, talking about how all the nations are going to be reached. Why, what's going to make all the nations come? What's going to give us such influence? It says, the reason we have so little influence upon unbelieving what? Relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practice from those of the world. Question. I'm going to blank that screen. I'm going to give you a, a quiz. Why are we having so little influence in all the nations right now? Why so little influence? Be that's right. There's so little influence because there's so little difference between what? Between us and them, between our way and their way, between our practices and their practices. So why would they need to leave where they are and come into us? If there's no difference, it wouldn't make sense. Now, my brother and sister says, parents need to awake and purify their souls by practicing the truth where? <clears throat> In their home life. Now, here comes a sentence that you should put to memory, that I should put to memory, that we should have in our mind and heart. It says what? When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach. Not man-made standard. That's not what this is talking about. Not man-made standard. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, talk to me somebody, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as what? Odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. I want, I, want you, I want that to sink in for a moment. Let that sink in. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, worldlings, those in the world, when they look at seven Adventists, they will say these seven Adventists are odd. What do you mean by odd? What does that mean? Different. Singular. There's nobody else like them. Only one group of people in all the world. Singular. Straight-laced extremists. In other words, they're so straight that nothing will get them to turn from the right hand to the left. They're so straight in their position, nothing will change them. Are you afraid of being odd? Are you afraid of being singular? Are you afraid of being straight-laced extremists? And the only way I'll be afraid of that is if the standard that you gave me is a man-made standard. I don't want to be extreme for man. I don't want to be odd for man. I don't want to be singular for man. But I want to be this for Jesus Christ. 
It says we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to what? And to men. Now, my brother and sister, someone says, well, see, if we're going to be odd and singular and straight as extremists, then the nation is going to run from us. But no. Do you know that that is what in sales you ever did sales before in sales? They have something called POS. You know what POS stands for? Point of sale. And any salesman, he's always taught a point of sale. And what that means, a point of sale is the place point, the place in which you can get a sale. Now, if I'm offering you two things, I have two cars that I'm offering you. And both of the cars are exactly the same. Same amenities, same color, same age, same benefits. But now this man is trying to sell you a car and you're almost giving your money <coughs> into his hand. You're getting ready to put your money in his hand. And he said, and another man comes in, no, don't do it. I have a car that I want you to buy. <laughs> and you stop for a moment. As you, your money, money's almost in his hand. You stop. Well, what kind of car do you have? Exact same car. All right. What color? Same color. All right. Well, does your windows do something different? No, same, same windows. What do you say to the man? <laughs> Why did you stop me? <laughs> Let me continue my transaction. You see, if there's nothing different, there's nothing that can stimulate a change from this to that. Now, my brothers and sisters, this difference that God has given us, this little difference is the reason why we're not reaching so many. In fact, inspiration says, if the church would manifest a greater interest in the reforms which God himself has brought to them to fit them for his coming, their influence would be what? Tenfold what it now is. In other words, when we're different, embracing the reforms from God is not going to make us able to less reach the world. We will have greater influence with the world, tenfold greater influence. We will have now a point of sale, a way of selling, selling that Adventism to the world, a way of reaching the heart of man. It says this is what God is trying to do for us. Now, particularly, it says many who profess to believe the testimonies live in neglect of this light given. What is one of the reforms that God has given us? Talk to me, somebody. The dress reform is treated by some with great indifference and by others with contempt because there is a cross attached to it. For this cross, I thank God. It is just what we need to distinguish and separate God's commandment keeping people from the world. The dress reform answers to us as did the ribbon of blue to what? Ancient Israel. Now, my brothers and sisters, I hope that we have a time to get to something. I'm going to mention something right now. All over the world, there's a great push. Did you hear what was in the news last week concerning the politician, the, 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 the so-called conservative politician that she said about her child? She said if her child was, she would rather the child uh, risk suicide than to allow someone to change the gender of the child. And all of a sudden, it was all over the media. The media blew it up and said, how could a, how could a mother uh, not uh, allow her, the child to make a decision to change her gender? Now, my brothers and sisters, we better study something because, see, what we're studying, dress reform has something to do with what we're watching right now. And by God's grace, I hope that we will have time today uh, to make it plain uh, as we go a little bit clo uh, uh, closer. Now, do we have much time? Yes or no? Every evidence in every field of knowledge is suggesting to us something very significant. In fact, we found that we have a crisis developing 2025. What? What does plus mean? Could be a little more. What does minus mean? It could be a little less. Now, my brothers and sisters, to be honest with you, you know what I'm seeing? I'm not seeing plus. You know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing minus. And I'm praying, dear God, give us a little more time. We see 2023. We're in 2025 minus right now. We're watching the cracks as we talked about developing. Now, that says, can you read that? Suicide of a superpower. Let me see the hands of everybody who's ever heard of that. Suicide of a superpower. You ever heard of that before? This is a book. This is a book that was written some time ago. A man by the name of uh, Pat Buchanan. You heard of him? Politician. Very famous. He lived, and he was a famous politician through the, through the reign of, of Nixon and Ford and Ronald Reagan as advisors to the president. There's no peon. There's no man who is unheard of. All over uh, 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 the, the, the television 
on shows like MSNBC. Here's his book, New York Times bestselling author of Day of Reckoning, Patrick Buchanan, Suicide of America. But now, now watch what he asks. Will America survive to what? Interesting. Now guess when he wrote the book? Let's see. Here's New York Times. What year is this right here? What year is that? Can you see that? So he's in 20, 2012. As the conservative polemist Paul, uh, excuse me, Pat Buchanan prepared last fall for the release of his book, last fall 2011. So he actually wrote in 2011, getting ready to release it. The release of his book, Suicide of a Superpower, Will America Survive to 2025? Some friends who work with him at MSNBC were what? Worried. The book, they told him, would pro provoke controversy and threaten his professional well-being. And it did. <laughs> Undeterred, Mr. Buchanan began his book tour. But his friends were right. He stopped being asked to appear on shows at <laughs> MSNBC. The cable news channels where he held had been employed for nearly 10 years. On February 16, the channel said in a brief statement, we have parted ways with Pat Buchanan. We wish him well. You know what that meant? That meant don't call us and we won't even call you. <laughs> that meant you were fired. Now, my brother and sister, I'm going to tell you something. When man starts talking like this, you will see that many in the church will part company with you. That when a minister starts teaching like this, you will see that he will be on a list of, 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 of attacking, a list of targeting. You will find that if you start believing something like this, that you yourself will be in that same way. It says, why was he pushed out? Let's pick it up. Mr. Buchanan, 73, a white Catholic. His departure was a disappointing overreaching both to the book, which conveyed his what? Long held concerns about the effects of of demographic changes in the United States. So now, what year, did he, what year did this man pick up? What year did he pick up? Talk to me. He said, will he survive past 2025? Now, when he said that, was he just picking up a, a, a number out of the sky and just, just taking a number, just, just basing some hocus pocus? What's he looking at? What does it say? What is, what's he looking at? Demographic changes. Now, is that ignorance or is that intelligence? I want you to think about it for a second. Now, a store gets ready to open up, Walmart, uh, Publix. Uh, give me another one they have down here, Food City. It's getting ready to open up. And so it just goes into community and opens up. Is that what it does? No, no sir. No, ma'am. You know what it does first? It sends out analysts that, are called, that do a demographic study of the community. And that demographic study says if it is wise to open up an establishment in that area. Now, my brothers and sisters here, this man who was a politician through three presidents, advisor, looked at the conditions of America and the world and said demographic change in the United States. And he complains about it by liberal advocacy groups. He said, looking at this, he said, I don't even know that America can reach 2025. What year did he write that? 2011. In the pessimistic book, you hear what they call it? Now, when you preach like this, you, you, you say 2025 20, plus or minus, you're not talking prophecy, they tell you. you. You're a pessimist now. It said, in this pessimistic book, he bemoaned the birth rate trends and thorough world, world immigration were precipitating the end of what? White. White America. Now, this is what he said. Now, I'm not telling you I agree with the book. I'm just telling you he saw something. Now, I'm going to tell you what he saw. Let's continue. Ah. I didn't put it there. The next line, I, I, I didn't put it there. I had to put it there next time. In the next sentence he said, you won't believe what the man said. He said, based on this demographics, he said, what it looks like is that America is getting ready to head to a civil war. Oh. What year did he say it? 2011. 2011. Now, my brothers and sisters, God told us this over 2,000 years ago in the Bible. Over 100 years ago at the Spirit of Prophecy. We see the exact same thing happening. Now, inspiration teaches us, inspiration teaches us, it says, experimental religion is known by but a few. The shaking must soon take place to purify the church, and preachers should have no scruples or hesitancy to preach the truth as it is found where? Where? Talk to me, somebody. Now, if it's in here, we shouldn't be afraid to teach it. Am I right? It says, I, it says, I, let the truth do what? I want to ask you a question. When you study truth, should it cut? Somebody will say, you know what, I'm studying BTI, but it's cutting me. 
Well, I would say praise God. Because if it didn't cut, something would be wrong. The word of God is sharp. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, if something's sharp and doesn't cut, somehow no application is being made. Am I right? If you have a sharp razor and it doesn't cut your hand, it should. the only reason why it didn't cut your hand is because it didn't come in contact with you. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? So if we're coming in contact with the word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword and we're not cut, then something is wrong with the word or something is wrong with me. Do you see? And so my brothers and sisters, it says, let the truth cut. Don't fight cutting. You know who cuts? A surgeon cuts. A physician cuts. It says, let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is they are afraid of what? Why is it that many ministers will not cut their congregation so that the congregation can be healed? Why? Afraid of hurting feelings. They look out over the congregation and they see faces looking back at them. Sometimes smiling like your con our congregation here. <laughs> I praise God for this congregation. <laughs> and sometimes gnashing teeth. And I've been in both places. But do you know that it doesn't matter whether a person is gnashing their teeth or not. By God's grace, the minister must tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now that means that I have to tell you some truth this morning. You know that, don't you? Do you want me to lie to you? Or do you want me to tell you the truth? Or well, even if you wanted me to lie to you, I couldn't do it. Amen. <laughs> it says, I have been shown that while ministers have not more success is, they are afraid of hurting feelings. Fearful of not being what? Oh, if you tell the truth, you're not courteous anymore. Oh, you were Christ-like until you told the truth. How does truth make you unlike he who is the truth? It says, and they lower the standard of truth. And what's the next word? What does conceal mean? Hi. Now, they conceal, if possible, the. Now, why is that dangerous? Why is it dangerous to hide the peculiarity of my faith? We lose influence. That's the point of hell. That's the difference. That's why we manifest little uh, influence on unbelieving relatives and associates. It says, I saw that God could not make what? Such successful. So then they will never be successful in this world. Well, it, that's not so. But not successful by God. Now, the devil can make such worldly successful. It says, the truth must be made what? Pointed. And the necessity of a... Let me hear you. Let me hear you. I want you, I want you to say it with me. The necessity of a... Urged. What does urge mean? Pushed. What does the minister should be doing? Pushing the congregation to make a what? Now, what have I been trying to do week after week? Pushing us that we got to make a decision. We can't stand on the fence. It says, and as false shepherds are crying what? Peace. And are preaching smooth things. The servants of God must not whisper, but what? Cry aloud and spare not. Well, what if the congregation stops liking you? What if the church stops liking you? What if you're fired? What if you're hunted down? What if you're pushed from city to city and state to state? It says the servants of God must cry aloud and spare not and leave the results with God. I think that's a good decision. What do you say? Because God never makes a mistake. God knows what he's doing. But you know that the reason why God's cutting us is not like a butcher. A butcher cuts. But the butcher purpose of cutting is to kill. Am I right? But the physician's objective in cutting is to heal. And the sword that God is sending us today is a sword to heal us because God is interested in saving us. And I want to be saved. What do you say? Now we got to jump back into our study. We got some ground to cover. And so normally we, we, we give a lot of review. We're not going give, to give that much review today. We got we to go somewhere. Amen? Amen? Are you ready? Now, what are we studying? Talk to me somebody. Heals. Hair and holiness. We're in dress reform. What are we studying? Heels, hair, and holiness. But before we jump back into that study, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Oh, Father in heaven, we don't have much time left in this world. It's falling apart very quickly. Father, 
we know that all of the signs of the times point to the fact that 2025 plus or minus is a crisis that we cannot avoid. Every evidence in secular history, whether it be political, economic, social, environmental, religious, and every evidence in biblical history points to the same time frame. And Lord, the reality is that there's no way around it. And I'm begging you, Father, that you'll give us a little more time, that you'll give us plus. I know it can be not much longer, but Lord, as much as we can, extend the limit because, Father, we're not ready. Our people are not ready. The world has no idea of the reality of what it means for this crisis to break in America. They think it's just going to be reset and all start over again. But dear God, it's going to bring us to a time of trouble such as never was. And even the historian himself was not even capable of recognizing how terrible this time is going to be without Jesus. And so, Father, I beg of you that you will put us in position so that we can fit a world to have a savior in this crisis, to have a deliverer in this time of trouble. And his name is Jesus. And so, Father, please bless us as we study today and help us to understand the significance behind our subject on heels, hair, and holiness. And so, Father, remove every distraction. Speak to us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles, we want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. We want to jump right into our study this morning, 2 Peter chapter 3. What book did I say? We're going to 2 Peter, the third chapter. And what we want to notice this morning, right at the very beginning, is that there's a direct relationship between holiness and the last days. There's a relationship between what? Holiness and the last days. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and I want us to notice it's very interesting that there's a relationship, very clearly, that there's a relationship between holiness and the last days. 2 Peter chapter 3. Are we in the last days in 2023, yes or no? I mean, we don't have to guess about that. I mean, every evidence, every week that goes by, evidence is stacked upon evidence. We see that we cannot even uh, uh, to grab all the evidence. Every, the week goes by before I can even tell you what has happened. And it stacks up and up and up that it would take, we could take the whole time just showing you where we are in earth's history. But my brothers and sisters, just knowing where we are is not enough. In the last days, there must be somebody who has been made holy. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Beginning in verse 3, let's read that together. The Bible says, knowing this first, that there shall come, talk to me somebody, now, remember what we're doing. We're noticing that there is a relationship between the last days and what else? Holiness. So the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. What are they going to say? Verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. How long? From the... Now, I want you to listen to the, the argument, the reasoning of these scoffers. What is the argument? What are they saying? Talk to me, somebody. What is the argument? That, that everything is the what? That everything is the same. In other words, there has been no change from the beginning all the way into the last. So they're saying, look, there's no change. Since the fathers fell asleep, from the beginning of time to the last days, there is no difference. Everything continues. And when someone says 2025 marks a crisis, someone says, how can you say that? Everything is the same. Every generation has seen. I'm going to tell you something. Every generation has not seen what we see today. In fact, there's no generation that has seen what we see today. Everywhere we turn, be it political, economic, social, religious, environmental, no matter which way we turn, we see that there is a change that has come. In fact, notice what it says. Verse 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing where? Out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water did what? Yeah. Now I want you to notice it's talking about a particular event in earth's history. What event is it talking about? Talk to me, somebody. So it's dealing with the flood. Now watch it now. It's dealing with the flood. So now notice what he's saying. The prophet says that the reason why they say nothing has changed from the beginning of time to the end of time is because they are ignorant of something. And they're not, they don't have to be ignorant. They are what? Willingly. 
What does that mean, willingly ignorant? What does that mean? That means they made a decision to be ignorant. They didn't have to be. They made a decision to be ignorant. In other words, they closed their eyes. It's almost like saying that you don't see me. Well, your eyes are closed. <laughs> if you open up your eyes, you'll see me. You understand what I'm saying? And so my brothers and sisters, they're saying they're willingly ignorant. They closed their eyes. That the flood took place. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Before the flood, it looked like everything was the same, but it didn't remain the same until the flood. Did it remain the same until the flood? No. Do you remember that just before the flood, drastic changes started taking place? You say, tell me one of them. Do you remember all of a sudden the animals begin to get on the boat? Am I right? How? How did they get on? By twos. Which ones came by twos? The unclean. Which one came by sevens? The clean. And so these animals came. Now question, when in the history of the world have you seen animals come out of the, the, the forest, out of the, uh, out of the woodworks, and just come into a boat with nobody guiding them? By twos and by sevens. I mean, can you imagine two of them came, a third one came, no, only two. <laughs> and they came by themselves. Never before had we seen this take place. And did those who were watching, did they see that happen? Yes or no? Yes. They saw that happen, but they did not want to believe what it represented. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says they are willingly ignorant of this event that they caused the world to perish by a flood. Verse 7 says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in what? Store reserved into fire against the day of judgment and perdition of what? So God is saying that from the beginning, there was something that happened and then there was a flood. And it's saying what held the world into a flood was the word of God. What held the world into the flood was the word of God. Then it says that same word since the flood is holding the world. That same word is holding the world until the day of judgment that is going to come now. Not water, but what's coming now. Talk to me somebody. Fire. So just as the word preserved the world until it was destroyed by a flood. So God is saying now since the flood, God is preserving the world that's going to be destroyed, not by water this time, but by what? Fire. Are you following? Now the Bible is saying it's going to be reserved. But now notice what it says. Let's continue. Let's follow his reasoning. It goes on to say, reserving to, uh, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Now look at the one thing. Did the word tell us how long the earth was going to be preserved before the flood? What did it say? A hundred and twenty years. Do you know that word was keeping the world alive until that hundred and twentieth year was fixed. But when the limit was reached, then the world was destroyed by a flood. Am I right? Now the Bible is saying that that same word that did that, that had a limit for the earth, that that same world, word has a limit for the world today before fire can destroy it. And it says, if you remember one thing, you will be able to identify that that same 120 year limit. You'll be able to know what that limit represents today. Not 120 years today. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, verse eight, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord. Talk to me as a thousand years and a thousand years as what? So it says, if you want to understand the limit, you have to know that in Bible reckoning that a day is like what? Talk to me, somebody. A thousand years. Once you know that, you'll know the limit just like the 120 year limit. Now, what do I mean? When God created the earth, how many days did he set up in the rotation of the earthly cycle? How many days? Seven. Seven. Which day reaches the limit? Which day reaches the limit? Every week, seven always represents the limit. Am I right? Yes. But now someone says, but well, seven days have passed by. But you have to remember something that with the Lord, a day is as a what? Oh. So when God gave us seven days to him, what was he really reckoning with? Talk to me, somebody. Seven thousand years as a limit. Now, we know that that last thousand year period is not going to be spent on earth. Where is that last thousand years period going to be spent? Talk to me, somebody. Yes. How do we know? Revelation chapter 20, it tells us in Revelation 20, 1 through 7, that that last thousand years before hell fire will completely devour the earth, will be spent in heaven. So then on the earth, we don't have 7,000 because 1,000 will be in heaven. So if I take 1,000 from 7,000, what do I have? Talk to me, somebody. So then how much time on this earth? Talk to me, somebody. 6,000 years of sin. Now I want to ask you a question. In 2025... Are we near 6,000 years of sin? Yes or no? 
Now, we've done the math here before. I'm not doing the math now. Now, we know that we cannot exact know the exact day and hour because we know that we don't know the exact year that sin came into the world. Am I right? Yes. But we can know the generation. And so 2025, we are in that generation that will reach the 6,000 year generation. That means that this generation shall not pass until what? All these things be fulfilled. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And the same way that that word, though the world didn't believe it, the flood came at that limit. Is the same word that's going to cause the destruction of the earth at the same limit. So when Patrick Buchanan said that this is getting ready to fall apart is not brothers and sisters because I believe him is because I understand the word of God, my friends. And when they line up, it lets us know what's taking place. Now, that tells me something. If six thousand is how long the earth has, that tells me something. That means Jesus must come by six thousand. Are you following me? But if he comes by six thousand, what has to happen before Jesus comes? Seven last plagues, close of probation, national Sunday law, civil war. So I'm going ask you a question. If that's 6,000, then that means that 2025 has to even be before that. Which means, brothers and sisters, that we are up against the last events and nobody will know it unless we believe the word of God. It will appear as everything is going just as normal until the bottom drops out. My brothers and sisters, we are here right now. As I sit in this room. Now, now as you and I sit in this room, we're here. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What should we be doing if we know that the end is so near? Look what the Bible says. Let's continue. It says, uh, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Now, I think that's a long time to suffer. What do you say? Is long-suffering to us were, not for him, but for us. Why? Not willing, look at the text, look at the text, not willing that what? Any should perish. So why is God waiting so long? Why is he waiting this, this 6,000 years limit? Why? Because he didn't want anybody to perish. That's a loving God. Amen. It says not willing that any should perish, but that what? Talk to me somebody. All, all should what? All should come to repentance. Is everybody going to come to repentance? No, but he gives the opportunity. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's to those who don't understand. And the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with what? Fervent. Fervent heat. That's that fire. And the earth and the works that are therein shall be what? Fervent. Do you know the Bible says it's going to be as a thief in the night, but not to everybody. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says that you brethren are not in darkness. You and I are not in darkness. That that day should overtake us as a thief. We are children of the light. Not of the day, uh, uh, not of the uh, uh, night or the nar- uh, of the darkness. We are children of light. We should understand what this means. But now notice what the Bible says. Is the world going to be burned up? Yes or no? You talking about global warming? <laughs> it's going to be more than that. Look at verse 11. Let's read that together. The Bible says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be? Talk to me, somebody. How? In all holiness. Now watch it. The Bible is telling us if the earth is going to be destroyed, if the limit is going to be reached, then you and I should be what? Holy. holy. We should be what? Do you know that if we're not made holy, we will be destroyed with the earth? Now, my brothers and sisters, God is saying here, it says, what manner of persons are you and I to be in all holy conversation and God in this question? How much of our life should be holy? How do you know? It says it right there in all holy conversation. That means does that include the way we talk? Yes or no? But does that word conversation only mean the way I talk? That word conversation means what? How I conduct my life, my manner of living. So my brothers and sisters, what this is telling me is, is that if I am holy, It's going to affect how much of my life? All of my life. So my brothers and sisters, this is why we must understand the relationship between what? Heels, hair, and what? Holiness. We're going to find that the issue is holiness. Now, holiness is to regulate how much? Everything we do. That all that we do is to be holy. Everything we do is to be regulated by holiness. Question, is it that way with God? Let's look at Psalms 145. I want us to notice something in Psalms 145. I want us to know that everything that God does is regulated by holiness. Psalms 145. Notice what the Bible says in Psalms 145. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Psalms 145. uh, Elder. 
Would you read this for me? Psalms 145. Psalms 145. And Elder, if you'll read for me verse 17, loud and clear, please. Now, notice what Elder said. I'm stopping for a moment, please. How much of his ways? How much of his ways? All his ways. Now, remember, what are we going to be teaching when the nations flow into the church? We're going to be teaching what? We're going to be teaching his ways. And God is righteous in how much? Continue. And holy in all his works. So any work that God does, what is he doing? Talk to me, somebody. How is he being controlled? What is controlling his works? Holiness. So everything that God does, all of his work is done in holiness. Does it make sense? Yes or no? So then holiness regulates everything that God does. So then if we are like God, holiness should regulate everything that we do. Does the Bible tell us that holiness should regulate everything that we do? Yes or no? You remember what God said we read in Peter that he says, be ye therefore holy. How? He said, as I, your father in heaven and holy, be ye holy, just like I am holy. And first Peter 1 16. Now, notice what the Bible says. I want us to know something. Notice something very interesting that shows us that this holiness should control everything that we do. Let's go to first Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go to first Corinthians 10. You remember that the last time we studied, we noticed particularly diet. And we noticed that the Bible said in Deuteronomy that the children of Israel were not permitted to eat certain things. While the Gentile world was permitted, permitted to eat certain things. Am I right? Yeah. And what did the Bible say the reason for that was? It says because they were holy. It says because you're holy, you shall therefore not eat. Because you're holy, you may sell it, but you may not eat it. You may give it, but you may not eat it. Because you are a holy people. Holiness was regulating everything that they were doing. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10. And we want to notice very carefully in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Let's read this text. Very familiar, but I want to look at an application that will help open help us to understand this a little bit more clearly. First Corinthians 10 in verse 31. Uh, would you read that for us? Uh, Sister uh, Ra Rachel. Uh, first Corinthians 10 in verse 31, please. All right. Now, what's the first thing he talks about? What's the first item that he says that which should be dealt with? What do you say? Nice. Eating and drinking. What do you say? Eating, eating and drinking. Now, we can call that diet, but that's eating and drinking. That's our diet. What we eat, what we drink. So the Bible is saying whether we eat or drink. Now, is it only talking about diet? Is it only talking about diet? No. How do we know that it's dealing with more than diet? It says, and whatsoever you do. How many things is that taking in? How many things? So this is dealing with everything in life. It says, just as God controls our eating and drinking, which we saw was holiness, this is how he regulates or controls everything in life. Now, according to this text, what is regulating everything that we eat and drink, according to the text? His glory. How do I know that his glory is regulating what we're supposed to do? What does it say? It says, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do, how? What's the next word? Do all to. Do all to the what? Glory of what? Of God. So this is dealing with eating, drinking, but really, how much? Everything. Everything we do. It says it should be done to the glory of God, right? Now, I want to ask you a question. I thought everything was regulated by holiness, but this says everything is regulated by glory. Now, do you remember the first angel's message? When he flies to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. You remember what he says? With a loud voice, he says what? Fear, Fear God. Don't forget that. And give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. Now, I want to ask you a question. If the hour of judgment has come, what should we be doing when the hour of judgment comes? What should we be doing? Fear God and give what? So then glory is required when the hour of judgment takes place. Am I right? All right. So now, in what would that affect of my life? How much of that would affect my life? In the hour of judgment... How much of my life will be affected? Why? Because if I'm to give glory to God and glory takes in what I eat and drink and everything that I do, then in the hour of judgment, everything I do should be changed to meet the hour of judgment. So whenever a people go into the hour of judgment on the day of atonement in the most holy place, then everything in their life should be regulated by that glory. Does that make sense? Now, listen. 
Let's take our Bibles now and see that there's a relationship between two things. Go to Exodus 28 now. Exodus 28. I want us to see something. Exodus 28. Because I thought from the text and Peter, we're to be regulated by holiness. But this text says we're to be regulated by glory. But notice what the Bible says in Exodus 28. In Exodus the 28th chapter, we see something very simple and interesting. In Exodus chapter 28, notice what the Bible says. In verse 2, Exodus 28, verse 2, we'll read that together. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 2. What does the Bible say? It says, and thou shalt make what? Holy, Holy garments for Aaron, thy brethren, for? Whoa, 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 whoa. Thou shalt make holy garments for what? Glory. What does that tell me? That holy and glory are dealing with the same thing. Just as glory is to regulate everything I do, holiness is to regulate everything I do because we're dealing with the same thing. Are you understanding? The only way that I can give glory, see glory is reflecting God's image. The image of God is reflected in splendor and glory, but God is holy. So if the glory is God's character and God's character is holy, then it's the same thing. Does it make sense? And so my brothers and sisters, it is God's character that is controlling everything we do. It is God's glory that's controlling everything we do. It is God's holiness that is controlling everything we do. So that if God is holy and we are holy, it should change every aspect of our lives. Now, my brothers and sisters, I see a question. That was Exodus 28 and verse 2. That was Exodus chapter 28 and verse 2. So holiness then is to regulate everything we do. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Very good. Now, look at Revelation 15. Let me show you that. Revelation 15. Now, notice what it says now in Revelation 15. In Revelation chapter 15, it makes sense now why God is calling us to holiness in these last days. In Revelation chapter 15, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 15, and we want to read now in verse 4. Remember, fear God, give glory to him. Our of his judgment has come. Revelation 15 verse uh, four says, let's read that together. The Bible says, who shall not what? Fear, fear thee. Fear God. O Lord, and do what? And glorify thy name. Fear God, give glory. Why are they going to fear God? Why are they going to give glory? What does it say? For or because thou only art holy. So what is it that will make us fear God? Holiness. What is it that will make us give glory to God? holiness what is it that is to regulate everything we do holiness and what is it that we must be in the last days holy now my brothers and sisters do you know that the sanctuary all the sanctuary is is the way of holiness all the sanctuary is is the way of what look at Isaiah 35 go to Isaiah 35 you know the structure of the sanctuary we've studied it many times then in that sanctuary you know that there are three places connected with that sanctuary am I right What's the first place called? Outer court. That's the first place. What's the second place called? Talk to me, somebody. Holy place. What's the third place called? Talk to me, somebody. Most holy place. So now if you look at that, you're going to Isaiah 35. If you look at the structure of the sanctuary, you see a way of holiness that you enter through the gate into the most holy place. Question. What word is attached to holy in the outer court? Do you know that there's no holiness? There's no word spoken of holy there. That means that a man who is not holy can start in that outer court. Who does that take in? Everybody. Everybody in the world. Anyone in the world can come to that outer court. But my brothers and sisters, when you get into that place, the second place is not called outer court. What's the second place called? Holy. Now we have what attached to the word? A place noun that is holy. What has happened? A progression of holiness. Does that make sense? What's next? Not holy place, but most holy. That means a greater degree of holiness. That means that holiness can progress. Does that make sense? So now if holiness is to regulate everything we do, when we come to Jesus in the outer court, we can come just as we are. But as we come closer to Christ, into the sanctuary, into the holy place, then everything about us begins to change because of holiness. And when we get into the most holy place, everything changes. Our diet changes, our dress changes, our music changes, our education changes, our worship changes, our life changes. And in that change is the point of sale. 
And that difference that is better is what we're going to be sharing with every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And as they see the holiness of God, they will fear God and give glory to him because they will see a degree of God's character that has never been witnessed before. But how can we give what we don't have? How can we share what we don't see? And so God is trying to teach us now this way of holiness. Look at Isaiah 35. Isaiah chapter 35. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 35. And we want to read now. Could uh, Brother Peters, would you read for me, please? Verse 8. Isaiah 35 and verse 8, please. I want to read this loud and clear. Now notice what this says. Very interesting what this text says. Isaiah 35 and verse 8. I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. It says, a low way shall be there. Now, you remember in the last days in the book of Isaiah, it talked about a church that will be low. Is that right? A church that will be established where? Exalted high on the mountains. How did they get there? There was a highway that took them up there. You see, my brother and sister, notice where it's going to go. Take us. Continue, my friend. What is it going to be called, Brother Peters? Talk to me, somebody. What is it going to be called, Brother Peters? You're not following this, brothers and sisters. The word of God is rich. We don't have to make up anything. You know, it's a wonderful thing when everything you believe is in the word of God. Amen. All seven day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible is explains itself. God has a way of holiness. Now, notice how beautiful this way is. Continue, my friend. Hmm. Now, what, look at what they might be. What does the next, next line say? The Bible says that this way, that even if a man is a fool, and I'm glad of that, <laughs> I'm a fool, but that way can make me wise. And instead of a foolish virgin, we can become wise virgins. If we follow the way, of holiness. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary is the way of holiness. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is where Jesus is trying to take us. And how much of our life will it regulate? It says, many will profess to believe the testimonies live and neglect the light given. The dress reform is treated by some with great what? The dress reform answers to us as did the ribbon of blue to ancient Israel. Now, ribbon of blue, is that in the Bible anywhere? Where will we find the ribbon of blue in the Bible? Let's go there quickly because I want you to see that the ribbon of blue was really a call to holiness. That's all it was. Look what the Bible says. Numbers chapter 15. Let's go to Numbers, the 15th chapter. And we want to look at that ribbon of blue briefly. Numbers 15. We want to pick up in verse 37. Numbers chapter 15. And we want to notice that this ribbon of blue this dress reform that God gave ancient Israel is nothing more than a call to holiness. Look at Numbers chapter 15. We'll read this together. In verse 37, beginning. Let's read that together. Are you there? Amen. amen. Numbers 15 and verse 37. Please write that down in your notes. You should be taking notes so that you don't have to just listen to what a man says. You've taken this down. You know it for yourself. Look at Numbers 15, verse 37, all together. It says, and the Lord spake unto Moses. This is not man creating this. This was God speaking to the prophet. Notice what he says in verse 38. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringes of the borders. Talk to me somebody. A ribbon of blue. Let's continue. It says and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and do what? And remember how much? So there was something about dress reform and the commandments of God. You better watch this. Because if we don't embrace dress reform, we're really not embracing the commandments of God. We're going to prove that. And if we don't embrace the commandments of God, will we receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast? The way we dress can identify whether we're going to keep the commandments of God or break them. Whether we're going to get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And God is trying to teach us this because guess what the commandments are? The commandment is holy and just and good. The commandment is what? 
holy and just and good. We're told that in Romans 7. So my brothers and sisters, notice the commandments now of the Lord and do them. Let's read it. And that ye seek not after what? What would happen if a man wanted his own heart, he wouldn't put on the ribbon of? Now I want to ask you a question. What if I'm going after my own heart? Will I embrace dress reform? But if I don't embrace dress reform, then I'm not really responding to the call of holiness. Look what the Bible says. It goes on to say, not after your own heart and your, your, your own eyes, after which you use to go where? Verse 40, that you may remember and do how much? All my commandments. Talk to me, somebody. And be holy unto your God. So the reason for the ribbon of blue that was to distinguish Israel from the rest of the world by their dress was a call to holiness. So now if I don't embrace this, you know what I'm really saying? I don't want to be holy. Now, is it important for you and I to be holy? Yes or no? Why is holy significant? Why is holy? Why is being holy significant? Because in the last days, there's a relationship between the last days and holiness. And we found that in the last days, God says that the limit is almost here. We must become holy. Why? Now, remember I told you if the teacher has to ask the question in several different ways and we still don't know the answer, then we didn't really learn. I see somebody's knee uh, just uh, moving. Are you, <laughs> you ready to talk to me? Who, who wants to talk to me? Who wants to talk to me? I see, I see somebody. What is the reason? I'm asking you now. I'm asking you in the, uh, out there in the congregation. I see a hand back here. Brother Garrison. Talk to me, Brother Garrison. Because God wants to marry us. Does everybody agree with him? Yes. Now, I would let him slide if this, was not, if this was not BTI. But this is not Brother Garrison Training Institute. This is what? Bible. Bible. Now, that's good. Now, where in the Bible would we go? How do we know that, that God wants us to be holy for a particular reason? Because, see, if the time of trouble comes and we're not holy, we won't be delivered. The Bible says that only the people who are going to be delivered are people who are being delivered by a man who is a deliverer. We read that last week. So my question is, can God deliver everybody? Can he? He has the power to, but will he be able to? Many of us will tie his hand. What will stop God? What, 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 what is the reason? How do we know that we need to be holy in order for God to deliver us and to save us and to marry us? Where will we go in the Bible to see that? I see Brother Tony. Thank you for letting if you pass. You're passing it around. Praise God. What, what, what verse are we going to? What book are we going to? All right. Now, does everybody hear what he said? Let's go there quickly. Ephesians chapter five. Let's go there quickly. Ephesians chapter five. Now, what verse are we going to start with in Ephesians chapter 5? All right. Now, b b before 30, though, before 30, you've got to back up just a little bit. Now, you're, you're at the right place. But before 30, you want to back up. What verse are you going to back up to? 23. 23. Now, why are we going to verse 23? Tell me, tell me somebody before, tell me some brave soul, tell me why we're going to verse 23. I, I see Brother Garrison. Why are we going to verse 23? <laughs> All right. Well, he said, not, she's not fully sure. Why are we going to verse 23? Because it shows the relation of husband and wife. That's true, but something else. <laughs> something else first. Something else first. All right, Amaya. I see Amaya. Would, let, would you pack her to put, put her on the microphone, too. Come, talk to me. 23. We need somebody to save us through the time of trouble. Let's read it. Let's read it together. Would you, in fact, would you read it loud and clear, Amaya? Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now question, does he save everybody or does he save the body? The body. Now, who is the body? The church. Do you know that in order to be saved through the time of trouble, we must be a part of his body or a part of his church? This is what God is doing right now. God has a bride. Now, you know, now, listen, I want to protect every person on this planet. <laughs> I want to protect every female on this planet. But if it comes down to it, and there's only one woman that I can protect, then I'm going to my wife. You understand? And then someone else has, has, someone else has another husband. Are you following me? 
But the husband can only save not everybody's wife. The husband saves his wife. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that if we are not the wife of Christ, he can't save us. And so this means then we must become his bride. Does it make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Now, when we read verse 25, it makes sense. Now, Ephesians 5, 23, in fact, let's go on to uh, verse 24. Ephesians 5 and verse 24. Would you, Brother Tony, would you pick up there? Ephesians 5 and verse 24. Not to every husband, but to what? Finish it to verse. Finish the verse. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So what we can see from that is that, 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 that we're not having husbands and wives for everybody. The husband is the wife. Uh, the husband is the husband of that wife. And the wife has one husband. Are you following? And so my brothers and sisters, if Christ is not our husband, he cannot save us. Now, can Christ marry everybody? Is there a condition in which we must be in in order to be married by Christ that he may save us and then take us through any crisis? What is the condition that we must be? See, every bride must be prepared. In the last days, Revelation says that the bride have made herself ready. She's been prepared. Well, how? What is the preparation? Look at Ephesians 5, verse 25. Uh, 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 Let's pick up in verse 25. Uh, who has the microphone now? Ephesians 5, verse 25. Would you pass that back to Sister Kia? Ephesians 5 and verse 25. What does the Bible say in verse 25? How? And did what? And gave Why? 26. Now, what is he trying to accomplish? Why is he washing us? What is he trying to do? Next verse, verse 27. Let's read that together. Verse 27 says that he might present it unto himself. How? Talk to me. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Question. Jesus was a spotless lamb. He's going to marry a spotless church. Now, what will the church be once he's spotless? Look what it says. A, ch a church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be, talk to me, holy. So what is God trying to make the church? Holy. holy. And without blemish. Now, once she's holy, what can God do? What can God do? Mary. Now, why can God not marry her if she's not holy? If we are not holy in God's church, why cannot God not marry us? Why not? I, I, we're not what? The of the same. Now, where did you get the idea that we're not of the same? Where did you get such an idea? Oh, look at your husband now. We got to study to show our. But you're doing good. You're doing. We're we all on the same team. We're all on the same team. Come right on in. We're all on the same team. So that's good. That's good. So now watch now. I want us to make sure we understand it. Jesus. Now, to be unequally yoked means that you are marrying two people that are not of the same kind. And in a marriage, that doesn't work. God will never give us instruction and then do the opposite. If God tells us not to be unequally yoked, he himself will not be unequally yoked. Now, how do we know what is he drawing from? Where, where in Ephesians? Where is Ephesians drawing from? I heard somebody at the very beginning was getting ready to read a verse. Very beginning. Where is he getting the idea that God is holy? We must be holy because of the same kind. Where do we know that Paul is drawing this thought from? From Genesis. Now, what does he say in Ephesians 5 that lets us know that he's drawing from Genesis? What does he say? What does he say? Go to verse 30. Let's go down to verse 30. Look what it says now. Go down to verse 30. Let, let's pass the microphone. I want Micah now to read this for me, please. If Micah, would you read this for me? I need a young missionary to read it for me loud and clear. Ephesians 5. And I want you to read verse 29, uh, verse 30, excuse me, verse 30 beginning. Ephesians 5, verse 30. What does it say? How? So he said, now the church is of his flesh and of his. Where do we hear that? Where do we hear that? You remember what, you remember what Adam said? This is now what? Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, look at the next verse. Would you read that? Uh, Shiloh. Next verse. Would you read verse 31? Verse 31. What does it say? Verse 31. You can share it with your brother. You can share it with your brother. Look on his Bible. He's the right verse. Look at verse 31. That, you have to open to your Bible. Verse 31. What does it say? Shall 
Good. So where do we hear that? Just as the same in Genesis, you remember, God said of Adam that, 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 that these two shall become what? One flesh. Now, in Genesis, we thought that Adam was talking about him and Eve. But in Ephesians, we read that he's talking about something much deeper. In fact, in the next verse, verse 32, let's read that together. 32 says, this is a great mystery. What is the great mystery? That two shall become one. This is the mystery of God. Then it says, but I speak concerning not Adam and Eve. I speak concerning what? Talk to me, somebody. Christ and the church. So what happened in Genesis was really a picture of the marriage between Christ and the church. And God took a bone out of his side of Adam to make him of the same kind. Remember in Genesis 1, all the plant kingdom had to be mated and, and, and multiplied with, of its own kind, of its own kind, of its own kind. And then God made a woman after Adam's own kind. But when he made man, guess what he did? When he made man, he made us after his own kind. Man was made in the image of God. His likeness. God can only marry of his own kind. This is why Adam could not marry a whale or a blowfish. That was not of his kind. Now, my brothers and sisters, God will not marry only but of his kind. Now, question, what kind is God? He's holy. He's holy. So then what must we be to be of his kind in order for him to marry us and save us from the crisis? We must be holy. And if we're not holy, he cannot marry us. We cannot have a relationship with him that is close and that is intimate and that is personal. Do you see? Yes. So my brothers and sisters, the issue is holiness. God created the big universe and, and God created this big universe. Is he really concerned with something so small as what? Hair. Because I study his heels, hair, hair and holiness. God is a big God. Create the entire universe. Is he concerned with something so small as my hair, yes or no? Yes. Because remember now, holiness regulates how much? Everything. Everything that we do. Now, let's look at the Bible. Let's see. Let's go to the Bible. Go to the book of Luke. What book did I say? Let's go to Luke 12. Let's see if God's interested in something so small as my hair. In Luke chapter 12, notice what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 12, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're going to Luke chapter 12, and we want to notice what the Bible says in verse 6. Uh, let me see. My friend, Selah, would you read that for me? Verse six, Luke chapter 12. You, you, you can't hide from me. I see you nice and clear. Very good. Luke chapter 12. Look at what the Bible says in Luke chapter 12. And we want to notice verse six. Now we're answering, we're answering the question, is God concerned with something as small as man? Someone says that doesn't matter how your hair is. It doesn't matter. You can do what you want. But we're noticed that God is interested in marrying us. In Luke chapter 12, verse six, what does it say? farthings good the Bible says not one of them is what right. what is he talking about a farthing uh, for, so for farthing sparrows what is he talking about he's talking about a little bird but then God makes a transition look at the very next verse verse 7 verse 7 what does it say in verse 7 wait a minute even the very what? Hairs of what? Continue. Praise the Lord. It says, even the very hairs of your hairs are numbered. Fear not, therefore. What's the last part say? You are of what? Thank you, Selah. Now, question. Does God keep track of the very hair of our heads? Yes or no? Is God concerned with it? Yes. Why? Look what it says. To protect the people of God from the corrupting influence of the world. As well as to promote physical and moral health, the dress reform was what? Introduced among us. This is Council of Health 598. It was not intended to be a yoke of bondage, but a what? So God in dress reform is trying to bless us, not bondage us or curse us. It says not to increase labor, but to save, save labor. Not to add to the expense of dress, but to what? Save. You know, if we follow dress reform, it will save money, improve our health, make us have greater influence with the world. It's a win, win, win. And you normally hear win-win, but no, no, it's a win-win-win. <laughs> it says, it would distinguish God's people from the what? World. That's key. And thus serve as a barrier against its fashions and follies. So if I embrace dress reform, it's one of the barriers that separates me from the world. 
Because remember now, if I'm a friend of the world, I'm not a friend of God. I'm an enemy of God. But if I take now dress reform, I get closer where? Talk to me, somebody. To the world. It says, he who knows the end from the beginning, who understands our... Now, you better remember that. In order to understand dress reform, we have to understand our own what? Talk to me. We've got to understand our nature. It says, he who understands our nature and our needs. Remember when we studied shoes and we studied feet and we studied heels? That the shoe was not made for, uh, the, the man was not made for the shoe. The shoe was made for the what? Man. It says, our compassionate redeemer saw our dangers and what else? And difficulties and condescended. What does it mean to condescend? Because of his great compassion and love, he got low. So low that he can even tell us how to dress, how to eat, how to fix our hair. It says he condescended to give us timely warning and instruction concerning our habits of what? Life, even in the proper selection, not, uh, not only of food, but what else? Love. I say that's a wonderful God. Amen. That's a God that's near to us, intimate with us. You know, there's some things you don't talk to everybody about, but you may say to your wife, you know, wife, I got something in the back of my head. Could you pull that out? The wife may say, honey, would you zip that up? You never to everybody else, but you can get intimate with your relations. You can get closer and nearer. God wants to get close to us. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what this is talking about. True dress reform regulates how much? Every article of clothing. Now, we talked about the last two things. We studied the entire body. We studied how to clothe the body and all of its extremities. But the last two things we were studying was the feet and the head. And we found out with the head, something comes out of the head. What comes out of the head? Talk to me. Hair. The hair. And so we needed to understand how the hair should be dealt with. How should we use the hair and how we deal with our Lord and maker? And what is the relationship between hair and holiness? Now, I'm going to pass this right now. I'm going to pass this right now. But what we're going to later on see is that there's a reason why God gave us dress reform, because he's interested in our what? You know, there's a way of thinking that leads to the mark of the beast. And there's a way of thinking that leads to the seal of God. Where's the seal place? Where's the mark of the beast place? And then he controls the hand by the forehead. Now, my brothers and sisters, we need to understand something. The way of thinking is the issue. This is why the devil will think to change times and law. What leads to the mark of the beast is a way of that little horn thinks. It's a way of thinking. What if I embrace his way of thinking? Then what will I also receive? The mark of the? Because I will have the same mind that he has. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. This is what the Bible says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your. What's in the mind? A way of? I want to ask you a question. You tell me. What way of thinking sounds like we're going to get the mark of the beast? Let's look at this for a moment. See, there's a way of thinking for the seal of God. That's holiness. How do I know? The Sabbath. You know the fourth commandment? Would you repeat it with me? You might, something might stand out to you. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. holy. So the Sabbath is holy. So the only way to have that seal in our forehead is that we must be holy. Do you understand? The mark of the beast is not holy. And so to get the mark of the beast, we must have a way of thinking that is not holy. The law is holy, just, and good. Does it make sense? Yes. So now, my brother says, there's a way of thinking, though. See, some of us are thinking that we're just not going to get the mark of the beast. We're going to come up and say, oh, Lord, I'm a seven and I will not get the mark of the beast. That's not how it's going to happen. <laughs> Do you know that the decisions we're making right now, the way we think right now, Micah, the way we think right now is going to either help us to get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Watch the teacher. Watch the teacher. The way that we think right now is going to help us in this direction. Now, that's why it's important for us. To learn how to think. Now watch. Sanctuary, way of holiness. Sanctuary is a way of holiness. Watch what this says now. This says, I'm going to pass this one. Pass on that one. Pass on that one. Ah, I didn't put it there. Mm. I wanted that one. I didn't put it there. What it says, I'm, I'm going to tell you one thing it says as we move forward. It says that those who are getting ready to receive the mark of the beast in volume 5, page 1881, it says in volume 5, 1881, it says that many, when they receive the mark of the beast, it's not going to be all at one time. It says the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us and those who yield step by step 
to worldly demands and to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. It says that there's going to be a step by step declension into the wrong direction. In other words, when I'm making decisions, Satan is going to try to control me one decision at a time. In other words, it's not when I just come to the, the, the Sunday law, all of a sudden I'm going to make a decision there. It means that when I was 2, 4, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, that all through the years as I'm forming habits of decision, it's preparing me either for the seal of God or for the mark of the beast. Either to be the friend of God or to be the enemy of God. And so God is trying to help me to make the proper decision, not tomorrow. He's trying to help me to make the proper decision when? Yeah. Right now. And so everything we face brings us to a place where we have to make a decision just like that. Now, we got back to here. Here's Time Magazine. Time Magazine says, now you know, how did long hair become a thing for? Women? Now, I want to ask you a question. Does how we weigh our hair important to God? Yes or no? Now, holiness regulates everything that we do. That means then that as we go into the sanctuary in the most holy place, it should show us how we are to wear our hair both as men and as women. Are you ready to study? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Here's Time Magazine. It says it dates back at least to what? Ancient, Ancient Greeks and Romans. I disagree. I say it goes back as far as Genesis chapter 1. It says, and according to archaeologist Elizabeth Bartman, even despite the ancient Greek ideal of bearded, long haired philosophers, women in that society still had what? Longer hair than men regularly did. Roman women kept their hair long, intended to part it down the center, and a man devoting too much attention to his hair risked scorn for appearing what? Effeminate. effeminate. What does effeminate mean? Like a woman, feminine. Does the Bible say they're going to make it into heaven? The Bible says no effeminate man is going to be in the kingdom of God. First Corinthians six, unless there is a conversion. Are you with me? Let's go to John chapter three in our Bible. Go to John three. You're in Luke. Turn over one gospel uh, book to the gospel of John. John chapter three. Go to John chapter three. Now, let's go a little further. You go into John three. Hold your hand there. Then it says the Bible carried on the tradition. Anthony Sennett. A sociologist who has written that hair. Now, I don't know if you fully understand what it's saying, but they're trying to say that it was they're trying to say that it, it, it happened in Rome in history. And then the Bible that came later followed that tradition. But we're going to find out that the Bible in the New Testament followed the tradition of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament came directly from the mouth of God. And it carried with us in principle back to the beginning of time. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. Now, it goes on to say. Uh, 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 for these, but I understand this is a historian. He doesn't know anything about this Bible concept. So it says he, found, for example, uh, uh, it said found this implication. For example, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, doth not nature itself teach you that if a man have what long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Now, this anthropologist and sociologist says it is most universally culturally found. Univers In other words, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That women have longer hair than men. This is a universal general truth. Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. Is this something the Bible just happened to follow the culture of Rome? Or is there a reason why God designed things a particular way? This is what calls for earnest study. Now, let's look at John 3 before we start studying. John 3, before we look at the heart of our study. In John, the third chapter, verse 19. The Bible says in verse 19, let's read it together. It says, and this is the condemnation. I better read this because, see, sometimes the devil tricks a person and makes them feel under condemnation. And so I want us to understand from the Bible what condemnation is. See, God is not interested in condemnation. God is interested in Education. He said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, not condemning us, not but educating us. Now, watch what my Bible says. John 3, 19 says, and this is the condemnation. Well, what is condemnation, John? That light is come into the world and men love what? Darkness rather than light because their deeds were. Now, do you know that if light comes in and I'm in darkness, God doesn't condemn me. That's not condemnation. Condemnation is the light comes. I see myself in darkness, and then I say, but Lord, I love this darkness rather than that light. And then God doesn't condemn me. I condemn myself. But if I see the light of the word of God, 
and I see that my life is not in harmony with holiness or the word of God and God himself, and I see I'm in darkness, I'm living in darkness, I don't fight it, and I say, Lord, I'm in darkness, please change my heart. Change my thinking. Give me love, dear God. I want to marry you. I want to be holy. Whatever you say, I want to follow your way of holiness. When we say that, you know, God doesn't condemn us. God takes us just as we are in the outer court and grabs our hand and walks us into the holy place. And as we change and we see more light, God then walks us where? Into the... And everything about us changes. What if I come to the place that I say, I don't care what God shows me, I will never change another thing in my life. You know what we do? We condemn ourselves and are only preparing for the mark of the beast. The way of thinking that is not willing to accept the way of Christ is only open to accept the way of Satan. And God is saying, please, I want to marry you. I want to marry you. I want you as my bride. Don't we want to be the bride of Jesus? But now, my brothers and sisters, in order to be his bride, we must be willing to give up everything to Christ. You know, in the marriage, how much does a, a wife have to be willing to give up for her husband? Forsaking all others and all else. I will take her as my only wife. No one else. She must be willing to forsake all else and take me as the only man. This is how the relationship that Solomon talked about in the Song of Solomon. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. That's ownership. Now, my brothers and sisters, so as we study today, what if we study and you and I find that there are ways that we are dealing with our hair that is not according to the Bible word? Does God condemn us? No. Does he condemn us? No. What is he trying to do? Educate. Why? Why is he educating us? Because he wants us to look bad. No. He's educating us because he wants to marry us. No. Does that make sense? Yes. Praise the Lord. So as we go further, we want to understand that this is what light is doing. All right. Did Jesus have what? Now go to first Corinthians 11. Let's go to first Corinthians 11. Let's go to first Corinthians 11. From where the text comes in first Corinthians 11 chapter first Corinthians 11. And we want to pick up in first Corinthians 11. We want to notice something. One of the clearest texts in the Bible. When understood that helps us to understand how to deal with the hair is in first Corinthians chapter 11 and first Corinthians 11. But it's often misunderstood because we don't understand what is really being dealt with. So we want to take a few minutes as we get ready to as we're in the heart of our study to deal with this for a little while. We may not finish today, but we want to get as much as we can before we close. First Corinthians 11. Look what the Bible says in verse 14. We read. I want to read it again from our Bibles, though. We want to read it from our Bibles and analyze it. First Corinthians 11, verse 14. Are we there? Amen. amen. Now we're studying. Oh, the word of God is good. Do you like studying the Bible? Amen. This is good. Let's read verse 14. We're, we're studying the Bible line upon line. Text upon text, here a little and there a little. Verse 14, let's read this together. What does the Bible say? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, I want, I want to put something down here as we start here. Talk about hair. And we're going to deal with male. And we're going to deal with what? Female. We're going to deal with male and female. And the Bible is dealing with both. And the Bible says, number one, that if a male has what? If a male has what? Long hair. It is a what? It is a shame. Now, my brother and sister, what about the woman? Let's jump down to first Corinthians, uh, back up to first Corinthians chapter 11 and back up to verse uh, five. Verse five. Let's read verse five together. It says, but every woman. Are you there? Verse five. Let's read that. It says, but every woman that does what? Prayeth or prophesieth with her head, what? Uncovereth, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her hair be what? So we find out that if a woman... If her hair is not covered, if it's not covered, it is a what? Shame. shame. Now, did you notice? One way of wearing the hair for a man is a shame. One way of wearing the hair for a woman is a shame. So it's dealing with the same issue. And what is really being dealt with in this chapter? Because, see, many people do not understand what this chapter is about. Now, over and over again, over seven times, 
it used the word covered or uncovered. Covered or uncovered. What is really being dealt with in this chapter, and we're going to look at it in just a moment, but what is really being dealt with in this chapter is two things. We're going to put this back up here, male. What else? Female. Here, what? Long hair. Shame for a man. We're going to say uncovered, what? Shame for a woman. We're going to find that the context of this chapter is twofold. Two things really being taught. How many things? And we're going to see it in just a moment. Number one is dealing with head coverings. Head coverings. Now remember, when we studied the Bible, what is the basic principle of dress reform? What is the basic principle of dress reform? Covering. So we learn how to cover the limbs. We learn how to cover the body, the torso, the whole body. We learn how to cover the feet. Remember that the issue of the great controversy entered but covering. God covers himself. We cover ourselves like God. Sin came in, destroyed the covering, but God restored the proper covering. It's all about covering. Lucifer was a covering chair. We went through the Bible and saw from Genesis Revelation that the issue is covering the first basic principle. So when we deal with the head, the feet, the shoe covers the feet. But when we deal with the head, we're still dealing with what? Talk to me, somebody. Covering. So we have to learn how to cover the head, whether we're male or female, in order to be holy. Because anything that is holy is what? Covered. Remember, we studied that. The angels covered their bodies as they were in the presence of holiness. Holy, 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 they said, and they covered themselves. God is holy. He covers himself. And when we uncover ourselves, we're saying that we are not holy. And so, my brothers and sisters, we have to learn how to cover ourselves properly. So the first thing that the chapter is talking about is head covering. See, that was a big issue in the time of the Church of Corinth that was causing division. The second thing that it was dealing with is, uh, 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 is dealing with structure. Order and authority. He's dealing with what? Structure, order, and authority. And God is now structuring, ordering, showing where is the authority because God is a God of order. He does everything decently and in order. So this is what he's dealing with. These are the two things. And we're going to find out he's dealing with it in the context of family authority. Family order, family structure. And family authority. Now we're going to see this. Now my brothers and sisters question. In society do we have a problem with these two things? Yes or no? Yes. We're going to find out that we do. And we're going to find out that they are actually related to each other. Now look what the Bible says. Let's back up to get an understanding. Because by misunderstanding this. Most people think that the head covering is dealing with a veil or a hat. You know like you say a woman. When they come into the church they put on what? A hat or they put on a veil. This is what most people think about. Many religious groups teach that way and they actually have something called prayer shawls or prayer uh, 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 veils. Because in the original, that word covering can be said a veil. But when you study through the Bible carefully, it's not even a question. It's very simple when you study carefully. Because if you go back to the Old Testament, when God had a holy congregation, do we have any instruction of God saying put a veil over them in the holy congregations in the Old Testament? No. So what about Jesus? Do we ever see Jesus speaking of himself, speaking of, uh, of a head covering as a result of coming together in a holy assembly? Do we ever hear Jesus speaking of it in the New Testament? This is the place in 1 Corinthians 11 that most people draw their concept from. And so what we have to do now is look at the text and not think what we think, but let the Bible do what? Explain with itself and then think what the Bible teaches. Now, let's go back to the Bible. And let's look now and try to get an understanding of this so that we can understand it for ourselves. Let's back up to verse three. First, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. He says he hears about the problems going on in the churches and he wants to teach to help bring unity. Let's pick up now in verse three. First Corinthians 11, verse three. You're there. Amen. Yes. Let's read verse three together. What does the Bible say in verse three? It says, but I would have, you know, that the head of every man is what? So the way he starts the process of teaching is rooting it in understanding headship. What is he dealing with? Headship. headship. Now remember what we read in Ephesians 5. To be married, Christ is the head, the church is the body. So we can see that this is husband language. This is family language. This is husband language. This is headship. Leader language. Authority. Ruler language. So as we go back to it, we see authority, we see power, we see ruler. This is all talking about the same thing. Let's go a little further. Now, notice the order. It says in verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. 
The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is. Now you want to find out that it's showing you the structure of heaven. Where God is. And also shows you the structure of earth. Where man is. And Jesus Christ is the link between heaven and earth. Between divinity and humanity. In himself, he has the blendation of both heaven and earth, and he blends them in himself. So you see Christ in the middle of both of them. Now, in heaven, it says that Christ is what? Talk to me, somebody. I'm, I'm looking back at verse 3. We're looking at verse 3. In verse, in verse 3, it says, the head of every man is, is Christ, and it says, and the head of every woman is, the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So in heaven, we have, we have Christ, as the man, but the head is who? Head is God as father. That's heaven. Is there order, yes or no? Yes. Does headship make the father superior than the son? No. no, it does not. The Bible teaches that the son and the father are equal in John chapter 5. So we find out that position does not produce superiority or inferiority positions suggest structure order and authority Amen. if a man right now says well if all of a sudden we're in a room and we choose not a leader of this room does that make that leader more uh, more special than anyone else in the room no. no but he has a position of what leadership a position of authority a position of order does that make sense yes. now that's the family of heaven so the father is not superior than the son and the son not superior than the Holy Ghost, the three persons of the Godhead. They're equal. The Bible call, inspiration calls them the heavenly trio. Now, my brothers and sisters, but what about on earth? Does God have structure on earth? Yes or no? Yes. What is the structure on earth? We have now what? We have now what? We have we have this. We have the same. Uh, we have man as it were on earth. I'm just going to put woman first. We have woman as it were on earth and then the woman has a head. Who is the woman's head? The man. And that is the husband, as it were, husband, father. So we can see this woman has a head just as Christ has a head. Now, question, does that make, because the man is the head of the woman, does that make him superior than the woman? Does it make him inferior than the woman? That's why the rib was taken from Adam's what? Side to reveal equality. Are we together? Very good. So now, who is in between the structure of both heaven and earth? Talk to me, somebody. Because who is the head of the man? Because the man also has a head. Who is the head of the man? Talk to me. Christ. Very important. Now, my brothers and sisters, headship then is the beginning of the talk of the entire thing. It's dealing with the concept of leadership, of power, of authority inside of a family government. Now, let's go a little further. Verse 4 says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head, what? Covered, dishonoreth his head. So if a man entered into assembly, praying, prophesying into assembly of worship, having his head what? Covered. covered does what? He dishonoreth. Give me another name for dishonor. He shames what? His head. Now, question. When it says shame his head, talking about this literal head? Is that what we're talking about? What head is it shaming? The head of the, of the man is Christ. Who is the head of the woman? The husband, the man. And who is the head of Christ? God. So when a man on earth says covers his head, he shames his head. Now, you have to understand, if it, why is that? What is it talking about? How would a man cover his head? Is it talking about putting a hat on his head? I mean, think about it. It's dealing with Christ now. Is it talking about putting a hat on his head? That's, that's what's bringing the shame? Now, so we want to understand what does the Bible teach him? Now, the Bible is very clear as you keep going down and begin to start explaining something. The same with the woman. Let's go a little further. In verse 5, it says, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head, how? Uncovereth, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were. Verse 6. It's going to make sense in just a little while. Hold on just a moment. Verse 6 says, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be now, we're going to see four words that are used here to help us to understand. Four words that are used here to help us understand. Covered. Uncovered. Shave. 
I'm going to say shorn shade. What are the four things? Talk to me, somebody. Covered, uncovered, shorn, and shade. Now, we're going to see, is it dealing with talking about a veil on top, like some hat or some covering? Or what is being dealt with when it does that? Let's look at the text now and let's watch the very next thing it says following the context. Verse 6 says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be not shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be what? Covered. For a man, verse 7, indeed ought not to do what? Cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Now I'm going to just, I'm going to suggest something and then we're going to uh, bring it out clearly. Now, I'm going to suggest something to you. Now, as we look at this here and looking at this process, I'm going to suggest that covering has to do with the length of a person's hair. The what? Length of a person's hair. We're going to see that uncovered also has to do with a length of the person's hair. That the shorn has to do with what happens to the length of a person's hair. And that the shave has to do with the length of a person's hair. When I cover something, uncover. Now, let's look and project it for, forward first from the Bible. Let's let the Bible explain it clearly. Verse uh, 14. Uh, let's, let's look at verse 13. Verse 13. Verse 13. Let's read verse 13. It says, judge where? In yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God? How? Now, it's dealing with what it means to be uncovered. Now, let's see what it does or how it deals with uncovered. Next verse. What does it mean for uncovered? Verse 14 says, doth not what even nature itself teach you that if a man have. Now, notice it's dealing with covering or uncovering. And what did it immediately deal with? Did it deal with cloth or length of hair? It said if a man have long hair, notice what it says. If a man have long hair, what happens? It is a shame unto him. So just as it said, the woman, if she shorns her hair, she's shamed. The man, if, he has, if his hair is uncovered, remember from the first, he was shamed. So we can begin to see that the shaming was the length of his hair. That was the covering that he put on his head. Not a hood or a hat, but the covering uh, that he put on his head was particularly the length of his hair. Now, my brothers and sisters, let's go a little further. Let's see what it also says. Verse 15 says, but if a woman have what? Now, what is the context? What is, was it dealing with from the very beginning? It's dealing with this head covering. Then it says, if a woman have what? Long hair. What else? It is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a. So what was the covering that the Bible was speaking of for the woman? Not a veil, not a hat. What was the what was the thing itself? Talk to me. Hair. So my brothers and sisters, this covering that the man put on was this long hair. For a woman, it's her glory. For a man, it's what? Talk to me. Shame. For the man. Now, then it says, in verse, uh, for hair was given her for a covering. So we can see from the beginning, if you go through this, covering, upcovering, shorn and shave is all dealing with a type of uh, a length of the hair. When, I'm, when it's covered, long hair. Uncovered, it means that the hair is a little bit shorter. Shorn is talking about actually when you, uh, 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 when you bring the hair to a place where it's very low, and I'm going to show you that in a moment, very low. And then shave is completely when you put the razor to the skin and the Bible speaks of it as being bald, being bald. When you take those four in your in your mind and you look at that and put those in the text, then you can understand what's actually being said. And you say, oh, it's trying to tell me that God was doing something different. Now, question, why would it be a shame for a man to have a long hair? First, OK, well, let me ask the woman first. Let me ask the woman why. Or what does it mean when a woman has long hair? Why is it that God made the woman with long hair? What did the hair symbolize? Anybody know what the hair symbolized? Covering, Covering yes, but it, l l let's look at the text. I'm going to show you. That, that's good. Look at what it says in verse 9. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for what? Yeah. Verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. I don't want to deal with the angels yet. That's, that's dealing with something else. I don't want to deal with that right now. But, because, <laughs> uh, but, but it says, but it says here, don't, 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 let, don't let the angels distract you on that one. <laughs> Stay right here. We, we, now it's clear from the Bible that what that means to us. It's not, it's not that complicated, but I don't want to go to all of that. Right now, we're looking at 
For this cause shall the woman have power on her head. But what was on her head? Talk to me. What was on her head? Hair. So what did the hair represent? Power. That she was under power. Under authority. Under leadership. Under subjection. She was submissive. Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands. So her long hair was suggesting that she was under the power of a man. So it says the power was on her head. Now, my brother and sister, now let's let's jump down. I, I got to get ready to close. But I, 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 we, we, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to we're gonna have to part. We're gonna have to do another part two. Is that all right? We're gonna, that's all right. Is it, <laughs> now, remember Samson? He was what? And what did he have? The hair was a symbol of what? Power. It was a symbol of power. So now you, you begin to start seeing it, and you're going to find out that everything God has, Satan has a counterfeit. We'll come back. So the hair was that she's under power. So now think about this now. So if a man were to have long hair, you know what he would be saying? That he's under the power of his wife. That's a shame. I'm going to say it again. That's a shame. Now, you may not think it's a shame, but that, now, see, we're going to find out what shame is. Oh, brother, I wish we had some more time. Listen to me. When you understand what shame is, you're going to say, you're going to say in your mind, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Now, so, but when a woman, now, guess what happens when a woman then cuts her hair short? Guess what she's saying? I am wearing the pants. I have the power. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is historical fact. Historical fact. Biblical fact. Fact. I mean, and you, you, you cannot disagree with a fact. I'm not telling you opinion. I'm giving you fact. Biblical, historical, in every other way possible. Now, my brother and sister, I'm, 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 let me take my time. I'm gonna, I got to close. I gotta, let me speed up. Well, let me, now, listen. So then, can you begin to start seeing the reason why God made hair was to show the structure of heaven. How wise God is. And what he's showing is the distinction of the races or the distinction of the sexes. Male and female to separate them. But in the last days, what would happen? There will be a confusion, a gender confusion of male and female. You better watch them. Remember, I'm, 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 I'm trying to get to the newspaper because let me see right now. What is going on all over society right now? Transgender. And we don't understand why. You know that dress reform was to be a barrier to stop us. Do you know that's why God said that women should not wear that what men wear? And that a man should not put on that which pertains to a, a woman because it's an abomination? He was trying to preserve the distinction of the sexes. This is the hair, the clothing, dress reform, a barrier from the confusion that's coming from the world, confusing the sexes. Babylon bringing this all into the world. And God wanted to have a church where this confusion was not there. But today, the confusion has even entered into the church. Sometimes today you have ministers that have long hair. Now, does God condemn the minister if he didn't know this? Does God condemn him? But we're talking about biblical truth. In the most holy place, we have to go back there and understand. Then there's a practice where the woman wants to make her hair look like a, a man. Does God condemn that? Yes, God does condemn that, but he doesn't condemn the person. He gives them opportunity to have light and then accept. They see, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. This is an abomination. This is an abomination. Now watch. The Bible says in verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a what? Shame. Now watch it. It says, what teaches us this? What teaches us this? Nature. Nature. Go to Romans chapter 1. Follow now. Go to Romans 1. Go to Romans 1. Look what the Bible says in Romans 1. Does not nature teach this? Now watch it. Romans chapter 1. And let's pick up in verse 26. Romans chapter 1 and verse 26. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 26 together. Let's read together. What does the Bible say? Now, it's so good. I got to read this with you. Let's read this together. Now, please understand. Let's understand it. Let's read with some understanding. Verse 26, it says, for this cause. 
God gave them up unto, listen, vow affections. But remember that circle that word vow. Circle that word vow. What type of affections? Now guess what? That word was used in 1 Corinthians 11. Exact word, but it's translated in different words in English. That word vow comes from a particular Greek word that is an exact same word in 1 Corinthians. I, I would have you, if you have a strong accordance, I want you, when you get home, look up that word vow in Romans 1. And then I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians 11 and look up the word shame. That word shame is the same word that is translated vow. In other words, it is vow for a man to have long hair. And it is vow, the, these practices they're talking about here now. I wonder what practices. Let's read. Let's read now. For this cause, God gave them up to their vow affection. For even their women did change the natural. Doesn't even nature itself teach you? That from his natural use, watch now, watch what it says now, from his natural use uh, into that which is, talk to me somebody, against nature. So what is vile or shameful is when you do something against nature. Are you following? Well, what is this one thing that's against nature? Let's see this thing here. What was vile that it was talking about? Verse 27. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust how one toward another men with men working that was not seem talk to me when you say men with men what is that talking about talk to me homo what does homo mean same men with men women with women homosexuality so this vow practice was what homosexuality which is against nature now watch now but it says when a man puts on long hair or wears long hair, he's doing something vile also against what? Nature. Now, there's a connection between the two. I wonder if the type of hair that I have can lead toward homosexuality. I wonder. I wonder. Let me go a little further. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to come back. We, 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 on part two, we have to deal with this. On part two. We have to go back because the question happens in somebody's mind. What about Jesus and long hair? How many ever heard Jesus had long hair? Remember that? Yeah. Now, how many texts in the scripture have you read that? <laughs> it's amazing. We let a picture. We let a picture. You remember? And I read to you. I read to you what the prophet said. The prophet said. Look what the prophet said. It says. I would say to those. I would say to you that I am sadly disappointed in the cuts prepared for such a book as the life of Christ. Desire of ages. I consider the brother accepts such figures that his eye and taste has lost his cunning. You cannot expect me to be pleased with such productions. Look at the figures critically and you must see that they are either made from what? Catholic, Catholic designs or Catholic. Catholic artists. This is eight manuscript, 456. The prophet says the picture of Mary has a what? Change that which against nature. Man, woman look like a man, man looking like a woman. Then it says uh, Mary has a man's face. The representation of Christ with what? The two fingers prominent. Now, look at the two fingers. What, what two fingers are there? Prominent. With the two fingers prominent, it says, while the others are closed, is wholly a what? Catholic sign. And I object to this. I see but very little beauty in any of the faces or persons. There's the scene of, of nature, though, landscape scenery, that is not what? So the nature, beautiful. But I can never rest my eye upon the face picture without what? Pain. Prophet goes on. She says in Council of the Writers and Editors 171, it says, should we not make investigation in regard to the matter of illustrating our book so largely? Would not the mind have clearer, more perfect ideas of angels? What else? Of Christ. If no pictures were made to represent heavenly things, many of the pictures made are what? Grossly false as far as truth is concerned. Do not pictures so far removed from the truth give voice to what? Falsehood, we want to be true in all our representations of what? Jesus Christ. That's what the prophet said. Now, my brother and sister, that means then we can't look at the picture and say, oh, Jesus had to look like that. We got to go to the Bible. What text would you give me that said that Jesus had long hair? Somebody said, well, he was a, he, he, he was a Nazarene. <laughs> you know, that, he, not a, it didn't, that didn't mean he took a Nazarite vow. It meant he was from Nazareth. That's what the Bible said in Matthew 2. It said he shall be called a Nazarene because he came from Nazareth. There's no text that says he had long hair. The text said he had hair like wool. 
But I didn't say it was long. Now, my brothers and sisters, there is no quotation on the, even in the spirit of prophecy that says on his life on earth that he lived having that type of hair in his historical representation, manifestation on this earth. There's one quotation that to the man who doesn't study would look like, I don't know what's being said, but not concerning his life on earth. So when you go through, you begin to start saying, this is the reason why most people say, oh, it had to be right. But you'll find out that these long hair, Jesus is dressed in a gold taga. He is the heavenly ruler of the world, familiar from the famous statue of long hair and bearded, what? Olympian Zeus on the throne. A statue so well known that the Roman Emperor Augusta had a copy of himself made in the same style. With the godly, what? Long hair and beard. This came from that Greek goddess, the, the, the pagan teachings. Not from God himself. And then it goes on to talk about what it came from. We have to come to that. I can't go to that. I got to get ready to bring it to close. But let me just show you this. This is the oldest. Let me just at least show you this. When early Christians were not showing Christ as a heavenly ruler, they showed Jesus as an actual man like what? Maybe. And you'll find this is the first image ever presented of Christ that ever found from a Christian person. The one that we see uh, uh, on, the, on, on the screens of Christ that came 400 years later after Christ. This is the first picture, the oldest picture they've ever found of someone trying to depict Christ right here. Now, tell me what you notice. Right, well, if you come close, you will see it. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is me. It was, it was short. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the blow up. This is the blow up of the screen. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters, Leon Studio One. Now, this is not a Bible, not a spirit of prophecy. This is history. This is what people study in cosmotology. Let's blow it up. When did the idea of women taking on short hair come from? It says the bob. Anybody heard of the bob? What does bob mean? It means cut. A symbol of what? Independent, progressive, and spirited woman. Let me just give you another name. Martin Eve before conversion. Strong women throughout history have been defined by their bob hairstyle with movies and media in the 20th century. The style became a popular part of modern fashion. Prior to the 1920s, prior to, now this is history, prior to the 1920s, what, talk to me somebody, long hair was a symbol of femininity and beauty, while short hair was considered what? Rebellious and undesirable. Women would not cut their hair as not to offend the men in her life. However, with the women's suffrage moving and an increasing what? Feminism. The mindset changed. The mindset changed. The mind. There's a way of thinking that blurs the distinction between male and female that leads to the mark of the beast. You better watch it. The bob became a, 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 a came about by an accident in 1915. Particular, but I don't want to go through the host, the host right now. Our time is gone. Let me pass on that. After the personal freedom allowed them during the World War, which ended in 1919, World War I, young women go out to work, got permission to vote, play sports, and demand to leave the house unchaperoned. Do you know that a woman was considered so valuable that she always had a protector wherever she went? Do you know that if you had a princess, when would you ever see a princess just walking around the street with no guard? Someone says, I want to be a princess, but we'll walk around with, with no guard. No. That if you're a princess, I don't care if you don't like it. You can say to the guard, leave me alone. He'll get beat up, but that guard's going to be right there with you. Because he know if, he don't, if he's not there, off with his head. You know? <laughs> but praise the Lord, we do it for love. Amen. Now, it says, new financial independence and emancipation followed. And cutting long hair became a symbol of independence and what? Talk to me. Strength equal to men. Hairdressers more accustomed to styling long hair were not prepared for the lines of women outside barbershops waiting to chop off their length. In 1923, the bob was worn in waves and the shingle cut emerged. The shingle bob was a little shorter. This is remember the memory talking about the different layers of length. Well, not prepared for the lines of women. Uh, the shingle bob was a little shorter in length. This new style filled the flapper girl spirit to be more what? Daring and controversial in style. In addition to the cut, women were trying out what? 
new hair colors, and perms. Now, I'm not studying perms and hair color. I'm not studying that. <laughs> All I'm studying is length of hair. Don't, don't, don't meet me at the church and say, what about this? No, 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 no. All I'm studying is head covering. <laughs> Many women decided to keep their hair long in the 1920s. Some women would pin their long hair up in a style that resembles a bob still to look what? In other words, they wouldn't actually cut it, but they would still try to make themselves look like they were in fashion. That's still a way of thinking. In the 1950s, the bob took on a different shape. Page boy and gamine looks. Gamine looks. You should say in your mind, what is gamine? I mean, it just sounds bad. I mean, you just listen. <laughs> I'm going to let you look that up. Though. I'm going to give it, I'm, 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 next time, next time. I'm going to let you look that up. Page boy and gamin looks look become popular. Bombs were jaw length and more smooth. You see, the, you see the style coming in? Structured and flicked out in the ends. Housewives would wear their hair in a structured bob that sits on the head with gallons of hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> but the bob emerged in full force in the 1960s when Vidal Sassoon gave fashion designer Mary Quaint. Did we study about her? The modern bob with an English twist. This style was the five point bob cut. It was short, ge 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 geometric, angular, and fussy, and easy to style at home, so she said. This inspired several new versions of the bob, such as the pill box, and it goes into the different styles. But what I'm watching you see is down through time, since the 1920s, the woman's idea of what was feminine changed. Question Was it because the Bible changed? The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. Change not. It says, The history behind the names of various hairstyles. It is one of the first things we notice about someone about being introduced. When you, when you look at a person, one of the first things you notice is what their hair looks like. Even Donald Trump's comb over. <laughs> or whatever you call. <laughs> on his, on, on it has his own Facebook page. But only 51 likes. Here's a look back over the years at various ways we've styled our locks. Talking about hair. And the origin of the names of these, of those what? I don't want to go through all the hairs. Everyone's pressing. I'm not going to go through all the hairstyles. But this says Pixie. Actress Jean Seberg is often credited for putting this short what? Boyish, Boyish cut on the map. Chopping it off in what year? 1957. Her first film role in the movie Joan of Arc. Do you see that? The name Pixie is said to have taken from fairies commonly portrayed with a similar short cut that is short in the back and the sides and a tinch longer on top. Step by step. Step by step. Yielding. Now. 1920s, at a time when long hair signified femin femininity, ballroom dancer Irene Castle bobbed off her hair. Let me jump on that. Women found barbershop owners slightly more amenable to the idea. The bob hairstyle during these flapper years took off and also has been flaunted in recent years by women such as actress, and it goes through naming them, and it says, as for the name, it derives from the definition of bob, meaning what? That's what the name means. Now watch it as we get ready to close. We'll pass it around. We'll come around. It says, why do females have long hair? Biologically, there's a reason. We'll come back to that. We don't want to look at it right now. Now, look at this. Now, I want to, I want to get ready to close. Look what that says. Read what it says, please. The lesbian history of short hair. Now, I want you to look at the name. Look at the name. What's the name? Eleanor Medhurst. This is January 2022. I'm going to bring up who she is. She has a, a, a place called Dressing Dykes Lesbian Fashion History. This place, this, this is the website, this is what it's called, exists as a space for what? Lesbian fashion histories, whether in the past, present, or my name is? That's her. Who is she? A dress historian. And, now we know what it means. Anybody know what that means? She's a lesbian. It says, I'm from Britain, based in Birmingham. And temporarily living in Tokyo with my wife, women with women, doing that which is against nature. nature. It says my studies both in undergrad and what else? So she got her postgrad. She she got her, 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 her definite in, in this type of study. Her masters revolved around what uncovering and analyzing lesbian history through the lens of clothing. In fields of queer history and fashion history, I believe that lesbian fashion is either sideline or completely invisible. Here's a space where it's going to be what? So she says, I, she's looking at history, she, and, and this is not a person that's biased. This is a person whose self is a lesbian, studying history. Are you following? 
Now watch what she says now. Now, that's who wrote this article. A historian on history. This is what she studied on, got her master in. Appearance is more than just what? Clothing. It is our skin, our nails, the tilt of our mouths or the furrows of our brows, the tattoos that may adorn us and the hair on our heads. We're talking about heels. What else? Hair. hair and holiness. Or our legs, our armpits. Of course, most of my work culminates in the study of garments as garments are what cover our. Now, that's why dress reform is connected with hair. This is the same principle. Something that can be easily swapped and changed at will. Now watch this now. Clothes you can easily change. Are you following? But watch it. Clothing may signify lesbian what? Possibility most often. But there are times when it is what? Hairstyles that lead the way. So what is most prominent in leading toward identifying and producing homosexuality? What does it say? Not just the clothing, but what? Now who is this? This is, this is a person against lesbianism? I've recently been working on a lecture about queer women's hairstyles throughout history. And this article is based on part of it. There's so much to be said about it. Uh, I'm, I'm just I'm jump, jump here through. But the focus of this article is the long steading theme and persevering lesbian stereotype of what? Short hair or fully. Where do we hear this from? Talk to me, somebody. Bible. This stretches from all the way back from the literature of ancient Greece, really behind that, up to the think pieces and Instagram post of today. And it is this lineage that I wanted what? In other words, it said that this line that we're seeing today goes all the way back to the very beginning of where it started from. There are countless modern articles in queer women quote, cutting or shaving their hair to feel closer to their identity or their what? It went back to Greece and talked about this Greek mythology. I'm not going to go to this. I couldn't even tell you the, the mythological story. of This is so vile. I couldn't even tell you uh, about that. Well, here's a picture in, 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 in the uh, here's a picture in the Yale Library. Do you notice? Look at look carefully. Look carefully. Look carefully. Look carefully. Look at the face a little bit clearer. Carefully. A portrait of Abigail Allen, a portrait of the female husband. So in other words, you have a woman that would dress like a man and a man that would dress like a. And there will be a male husband. I'm mean, rather excuse me, a female husband and a male wife. What has happened to the rose? You better watch it. What does the Bible call that? Shame and abomination. Now, a very early example as well as fictional one. However, uh, as the centuries went by, there were other instances where possible lemmings would adopt short hair in the 18th century. It says, let me pass on that. That's female husbands. This all changed when? Women's hair had lived many lives already at this point, but hairstyles had typically been a base of but hair had, hairstyles had typically been a base of what? Long hair that could then be braided or twisted or curled. In the 20s, it was time for women's hair to be chopped. Modernism was in fashion. And with it came the boyish look encompassing trends for women, including tailored clothing, high collar, and what? In other words, what was being tried at this time? Not only the boyish hair, but now women begin to start dressing like what? Men, and for the first time, started putting on pants. We studied this already in history, in our biblical uh, class on dress reform. It goes on to say, encompassing trends for women, including tailored, we read that, uh, 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 although trousers were only worn for sport or extremely casual occasions, a key aspect of the style was hair. hair and a description of the hairstyle that were popular can be seen below to have one's hair bob was to have it cut. Now, this says others followed the extreme eating crop, a style in which hair was excessively closely cropped and dressed like that of a. Yeah. Now, do you notice what's happening over and over again? There's this cross dressing that is taking place before our very eyes. And this cross dressing means something now. Why the bob has remained an iconic feminist symbol for over what? Now, what we have to do, we have to go back down to the Bible and actually see, does the Bible actually show us that this would produce that same homosexuality in Romans chapter one that was the vow and against what? Nature. And if we do it now, what will it do inside of homes? Homes that practice this style, it would change the. It would change the rose. 
and the order of the home. Now, when you change the roles and order of the home, does it please God or does it cause a problem in society? It causes a problem. Now, they go back to it. Now, I'm going to get really close. This says the history of what? No, I, can't, I can't go through it right now. Now, listen. What we have to do is start laying something out now. We have to now start laying out how. Once we see the length of the hair, we need to start finding out how should the hair be. You know, there are men today as ministers that have dreadlocks. You know that, right? There are ministers from the pulpit who have dreadlocks preaching. Some sincere. Does God condemn them if they're ignorant of this? Yes or no? No, no he does not. But he does want us to educate because holiness demands that we do things the way who does it? God does it. Not the way man does it, but the way God does things to make us pure and holy. Now, my brothers and sisters, what we have to do is now go back through and start following this thing through. I, I want to give it to you right now. Because see, once we see this, our mind will say, I understand what is happening, not only in society, but even in our Seventh-day Adventist churches. Something is happening right now. And my brothers and sisters, it doesn't stop there because someone will say, well, I'm never homosexuality. But the question is, is our house today in order? If the woman is controlling the house, you know, this is against God's order. Do you know that God intended that the head of the house was to be not a female, but was to be who? Talk to me, somebody. Is there a reason for this? Yes or no? Now, do you know that any home that has a woman at the head of it is preparing to receive the mark of the beast? There's only one church that you can be in and have a woman at the head. Let's close in Revelation 17. Let's close in Revelation 17. There's only one church. You know, there's a church that prays and they don't say our father, which are in heaven. You know, there's a church, you know, what they pray to. They pray to Mary. As the matriarch of heaven. It changes the order of God that will lead to the change of a Sabbath from Sabbath, the seventh day to Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 17. Notice the structure of that church. Notice the structure of that church. Go to Revelation 17. Go to Revelation 17. Look what it says in Revelation 17. We want to notice now, speaking of this uh, impure woman, this false church. In Revelation 17, verse 3, it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Was this a pure woman or a vile woman? Verse 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written. What was her name? Mystery. What's the next name? Babylon. What does Babylon mean? Talk to me, somebody. Confusion. We're going to show you that this is what it's talking about. Then it says, well, what is one of the confusion? Let's look back now. Jump down now where it says the verse uh, 17. Revelation 17, verse 17. It says, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and have given their kingdom into the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And let's read verse 18 together. Let's read it slowly now. And I want to see if you read it with understanding. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth under the kings of the earth. Is this power on her head or is this woman having the power? Now remember, the image of the beast is where a woman has the power to control the state. Not the state, the man, the supporter, controlling the woman. Not that, that, that in the wrong way of combining church and state, but a power where the woman is actually over the state or the kings of this earth. Now question, is that against nature or with nature? What power is this? Is this the true church or the false church? So if I have this form of government in my home, all I'm doing is preparing a way of thinking that is preparing me to wander after the beast and to go along with Babylon. I don't want to go with that. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, look what this says. Look what this says. Look what this says now. Look what this says. I'm going to pass on this. Right here. God does not what? Requires to give him anything that is for our best interest to. Now, is God going to require some changes inside of us? Now, we're getting ready to say, I'm going to tell you something. I, now, I would say next week, but I, let me tell you this before I say that. Next week, we need your prayers. We're not going to be here next week. We have to go out of the country. Uh, there was an emergency that took place. 
and someone who was close to the family and ministry died and they had to be funeralized and they asked if we would come in and do the eulogy to help funeralize uh, the family and the particular uh, husband of the family. So we're going to be, we're going to have to leave the country uh, within the next couple of days. And then doing so, I'm so pleased, pray for us. Amen. So we normally would pick this up next week, but because we will not be here next week, uh, by God's grace, we're going to still go on and we're going to be praying and studying. But please, I don't want you to forget where we are because we've got to get back here because see, what we're going to find out now is that what is happening in society is directly happening because we don't understand for the, the reason behind the thinking and of how to fix our here. Now that, that, that sounds something so that sounds something like that sounds what that sounds small, but it's not the hair. It's the way of thinking that controls the hair. Then we're going to find out that that way of thinking will cause us to do other things. And it's going to cause us to make either a right decision or a wrong decision. Either have the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Either become God's friend or become God's enemy. I don't know about you, but whatever is what God wants, I want to be like him. What do you say? I want to be holy. Question. Do we have a long time? I'm going to close right here. I'm going to get tempted. I'm not, I don't even want to get tempted. I'm going to put it right here. Listen, brothers and sisters. Right now in the day, the majority of our homes are not following the thinking of heaven. Do you know right now in the day that most homes, the children control mother and mother controls father? That's the structure of most homes today. All of a sudden, something wants to have the child wants something in the house. He can't. Sometimes he may not be able to go to father. The father may say no. So you know what he does? The child cries. <laughs> Cry to mother. Then all of a sudden, mother comes to father. And father says, I said no. And my mother says, oh, husband. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the mind of father changes. But he's not thinking like a man. You know what he's thinking like? He's thinking like something that is not a man. Now, my brothers and sisters, it may seem cute like that right now. But you know that no home can be happy in that state. The only thing that will produce is a divided home. When the roles of husband and wife are lost, then the order of the home is broken down. And the result is a confusion and destruction of the morality of society that produces homosexuality and lesbianism that we have now today. And we see in our generation, this is the last sign. Mommy, if you just, this is the last sign before there's a collapse of a nation. This last state. And my brothers and sisters, that same sign is right here in our church. We should be praying, God, set my house where? So how do we do it? We set it by saying, okay, I'm going to now control my home. I'm going to make my family do whatever I want it to do. Is that? We go back to the Bible. And we say, Lord, teach me to think like you think. And whatever you say, on any aspect of life, I want to follow. Whether it's diet or dress, whether it's hair or holiness, to do everything. After the will of God. I want to be married to him. What do you say? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. We're so thankful for what our ears have heard. What our eyes have seen. Lord, we were only able to touch the surface of this. We're going to come back and look at it again and look at another layer so that we can understand clearly. That the covering that you want to put on us. Number one is a true husband and father in the home. And then Christ inside of us, the church. And then you can save us from this wicked, wayward, confused world. In this time of trouble, you can deliver us if we follow Jesus and his plan. Lord, the world is falling apart. It's leading to a division and a civil war. And partly every revolution was because you will see a dress involved in the revolution. And Lord, it changes the way we think. And the way we think changes the way we live. And so, Father, we need you to revive us. We need you to reform us by again turning our minds to Jesus Christ so that we can learn to think his thoughts after him. And Lord, you want to teach us how to live so that you can marry us so that we can know you as a friend. I pause the prayer this and ask this morning, is there anyone here today that says, Lord, I want to follow your rule not only in what is called spiritual things of church, but on every detail of my life I want to follow the way of holiness. If that's your desire, just raise your hand. Lord, I want to follow the way of holiness. 
even specifically the details of my everyday life. Heavenly Father, you see the lifted hands. I'm lifting mine. We were studying hair today, and we begin to see that there's a length of hair that you want men to have. There's a length of hair that you want women to have. And Lord, you begin this study. We did not finish it. But Lord, we can already begin to see that it is diametrically different than what the world is offering, what the world is calling for. Help us to be willing to leave the world and to follow Jesus. We thank you, Father. Give us the love that will make us willing to follow wherever you lead. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.